Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good to see you. Good to be in the house of the Lord together. It is wonderful to be able to worship God, to be able to open our hearts to the one who has saved our hearts, to the one who has captured our hearts. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. The words will be printed on the wall for you. Let's open our hearts, open our mouths, open our minds to the glory of our God. You are my joy. You are my song. You are the well. I am drawing from you are my refuge my whole life long oh where else would I go surely my God is the strength of my soul your love defends me your love defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me day after day night after night i will remember you're with me in this fight although the battle it rages on the war's already already won surely my God is the strength of my soul your love defends me your love defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me we sing hallelujah You're my portion, my salvation, hallelujah. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me, your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. We sing hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation. Hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation. Hallelujah. my salvation let's pray together our Lord our God we thank you for indeed you have proven to be our portion you are indeed our salvation we thank you O oh God as we approach you in worship this morning as we open up your word to hear your voice to us we ask O oh God that you would receive the glories you deserve Help us, Lord, to see you better, and Lord, to know you better, and to give you the honors, the glories you deserve better. We ask, O oh God, that as a result of our time here, we would be better equipped to live out our Christian lives in the midst of the darkened world. Give us, Lord, the hope we long for. Remind us of the truths that you've given to us that transform us. And Lord, we pray that together we would live as your people. May you receive all the honor that you deserve. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see you on this Sunday morning. This morning we're going to go back to our study in the book of Jude. You'll recall that um, this New Testament book is very short, only 25 verses. But I think you know very well that... Um, 
Only because the book is short doesn't mean there's not much to say about it. And so we're going to take a look at each verse, only 25 verses, but we'll take a look at each one of those verses and see what God is saying to us as Christians in this day and age. And boy, is there plenty for us to learn. And I trust that God will use it for your benefit, for your, for your Christian life, and of course for us as a church, as we contend for the faith that's been entrusted to us. Here are a few announcements this morning. First of all, this Wednesday, we're meeting downstairs to pray together. And before prayer, we're going to have dinner. So I believe it's chicken, pulled chicken. Uh, we'll be eating together downstairs. And uh, afterwards, at 7 o'clock, we'll begin to pray. So 6 o'clock dinner, feel free to join us. Have a little something to eat. And then afterwards, we will pray beginning at 7 o'clock. It'll be a wonderful time of simply fellowshipping together and speaking to God together. It is a good thing when God's people pray. God works through the prayers of his church. And so we look forward to seeing what God will say and do in the future because we pray today. Right, so please do join us. Also, so that's this Wednesday, 6 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock prayer. Mulch and window love your church day. Why do I say that? Because the trustees want to mulch, and they want the windows clean. So if you're a mulcher, feel free to come. If you're a moocher, maybe you should stay home. But mulchers come, and window cleaners come. We don't need many window cleaners, but obviously the more we have, the quicker it goes. And it's just good to be able to look out the windows and see the spring weather. So this will be on May 4, Saturday at 8.30. And it's not too far away. May 4, Saturday, 8.30. That following Sunday, after our worship service, we have a congregational meeting downstairs along with lunch. So we'll have some lunch, and then we have a couple things to touch base on regarding our church downstairs May 5th. Also, ladies... There's a retreat coming up this year where you are going to be going to Tri-State Camp. I can't say we because I'm not invited, but you ladies, Tri-State Camp is just over the mountain, just minutes away from here. And last week, I believe I gave you the wrong dates, right? I hope I got them right this time. Um, somebody reminded me to read my wife's emails. So um, it is the 19th and the 20th, the 19th and the 20th. You can't stay overnight if you want, or being that you live so close, you could come home and go back in the morning. And so that's Tri-State Camp. The theme is Master Designer, a retreat just for women, uh, no men allowed. Those are the announcements this morning, and prayerfully, you'll be able to participate. Certainly, we would ask that you pray for what we do here. Um, some months are very busy, some months are not. In either case, anything that happens that's good is a result of God's presence, prayer. If you pray, we do better. And so we would ask for you to pray. Very good. Let's read together from the scriptures. Mark, I mean, Scott. <laughs> I keep calling Scott Mark. I don't know why, but it is Scott, right? That's right. Okay. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you could turn to uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, we'll be starting in verse uh, 10 to 22, uh, and this passage concerns itself with uh, the importance of being holy. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you was holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Amen. There once was a Japanese soldier who for 29 years continued to fight World War II on a small Pacific island because he had never heard that the war was over. Rescue parties were sent to search for him, but he hid because he thought they were enemy scouts. Leaflets were dropped, newspapers were dropped, photographs and letters from his family and relatives were dropped, all saying that the war was over and that he didn't have to fight anymore. But believing it to be enemy propaganda, he continued to live as if the war was ongoing. Finally, in 1974, a young man went on a mission to find this legendary soldier. He succeeded where so many others had failed. This long lost Japanese soldier, now in his 50s, personally read the orders from his commanding officer that the war was over and had been for nearly three decades. The soldier's words were, what have I been doing all these years? 2,000 years ago, a man went on a mission to rescue you and me. He came to die in our place and to share good news with the whole world that the war is over. He has already won. And if we'll believe on his name, he will give us freedom. Freedom from bondage, sin, addiction, and fear. And the freedom to live lives of victory, truth, love, service, and forgiveness. The question is, will we believe and embrace the good news of freedom? Or will we continue to live our lives as if we're still in the war? And indeed, that is so true, that the war is over, that Christ has given us victory. And the amazing thing about the Christian life is that we move from fighting against ourselves, fighting against the world, to now contending for what is true. So whereas the fight, the struggle against the, struggle against the old man, the, the sinful man, uh, the, the struggle f in, in searching for happiness or meaning in life, uh, well, that's all satisfied through Christ. But when we come to Christ, there, there's a new quest in the Christian's life, and that quest is to bring glory to God. And how do we bring glory to God? Well, we do so by knowing His Word and by practicing His Word. Also by defending His Word, by standing on those truths. And so we're called to contend for the faith, to contend, to strive for what is true about God. And that, of course, is revealed to us in, in this book. His truth is laid out for us. And so we're called to then contend for what is true, that we would know God, live for God, and tell others about God. And as we study the book of Jude, we learn again and again how important it is to contend for that faith. Let's stand together and let's sing. I believe we're singing out of the hymnal number 12. Everlasting 
copy of the Bible to that little book towards the very end of the New Testament, the letter of Jude. That's just before the book of Revelation. Jude. There's only one chapter, and we'll be looking at verses 1 and 2. I'll read it to you. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Let me read on. Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we ask that on uh, this hour you would speak to us, open our ears, our hearts, that we may comprehend your truth. I pray, Lord, that you would keep me from error, and that, Lord, each one of us here would be able to walk away this morning knowing more of you and knowing more of your expectations of us as the one who brings us not only to salvation uh, but to a place of sanctification Help us, Lord, to know you and to live for you properly. Amen. This morning we're going to take a look at some earmarks, earmarks of the Christian. Now, I realize that when we hear that word, usually it's within the sphere of Congress and talking about a a bill that's being legislated, earmarks. And, And most people don't care for earmarks. Uh, in that context. However, this morning we're going to take a look at earmarks in a whole different context. We're going to take a look at earmarks for the Christian. Now, originally that term earmark uh, was a mark, was was used for a mark on animals, uh, whether you're talking about a branding on a cow or um, a tag on a sheep's ear. And and the purpose for that earmark or that branding was for to tell others who that animal belonged to. It was a sign of ownership. Uh, Today, the term is used a bit differently. Um, Today, the term is used to uh, explain how something is to be used. Uh, For example, you earmark some money in your budget. You earmark it for college or for retirement or maybe for this week's groceries. That money is earmarked. Uh, Or maybe uh, you can say, I earmarked it uh, to disclose who will benefit from this amount, who will receive this. Uh, For example, she is earmarked to receive that grant. It's hers. I remember growing up in a house with too many people. My mother would earmark a piece of pie for me. And she would say, don't anybody eat this pie, it belongs to your brother. And maybe, just maybe, when I got home, it would still be there. But she tried. Week after week, she would try. Earmark. To earmark something means that you allocate or that you set it aside. Uh, you, You reserve it for a particular person or maybe a particular cause or purpose. What I want to point out to you this morning is that the Christian 
is earmarked. That there are earmarks for the Christian. Maybe you woke up to the news this morning that there was a significant attack of over 200 drones and missiles from Iran into or toward Israel. And uh, most of them were taken down by Jordanian, American, and Israeli forces. Uh, I heard this morning as well that some planes were taken down from the Iranian Air Force. 200. I'm glad to say that a very few actually landed in Israel. Uh, only one um, person was injured, a 10-year-old girl, one too many, I would say. But nonetheless, just one uh, person was injured, and from what I heard, she is, is expected to recover. But it's dangerous, isn't it? And depending on what Israel does next is going to determine what Iran is going to do. And there's a great danger of this spiraling out of control and yet another war. Germany has vowed that it would side with its ally Israel and would speak to the other allies as well. And the United States said likewise. And these are dangerous times. We do not know what to expect. And I would say, uh, friends, church, pray. Pray. Pray that wisdom would be had. Pray that buttons would not be pushed. Uh, pray that there would be calm heads under those uniforms, under those badges and, and stripes. This world is, I think, and, and in my estimation, in my reading, in, in greater danger than it has been in many, many years. I think we could say that it's been in a more risky position, but not in a long time. Uh, today, we are indeed living in a world that seems to be spiraling downward. And maybe you work alongside of these people. Maybe you live close to them. People who are just looking for hope, and the only hope they're getting is Fox News. That's not much hope. And CNN makes it worse. No hope. And people are just longing for answers. And what is going to come of this? We're living in a world where people are so easily swayed by loud, demanding voices. And as they scream, we listen and say, well, you know, I think they might have a point. For so many people, this sounds rather logical. Well, love is love. I can't argue that. I can't argue against it. And yet, as we hear what they're crying out so loudly and so demanding, we sit back and say, but there sounds like there's something off there. It sounds right, but it doesn't sound right, and often we can't put our finger on it. We're living in a world that's just starving for sensibility, and a world that's, that is looking for a reason to be optimistic. And people today are wondering whether or not they are victims or are they the victimizer. Am I the oppressed or am I the oppressor? In other words, should I hate myself or should I feel sorry for myself? In either case, you lose. And that's the world we're living in. It's a world where right and wrong are being completely overhauled and truth cannot be defined. It's not a pretty place. Not at all. However, it is in this forum, it is in this downward spiral that Christianity enters. It is in this atmosphere that Christianity brings hope. And Christianity comes through you. It comes through the Christian. As we come alongside of these people who are starving for hope, looking for answers, Christianity steps in. And you are the conduit. The Christian faith comes 
with a set of core beliefs, and we call that doctrine. My friends, don't ever be afraid of the word doctrine. It's a good word. It's a beautiful word. Some people say, well, I like to think outside the box. Listen, the box is big. The box is beautiful. The box is good. The box of doctrine does not need to change. Certainly, you do not want to eliminate it. You know, there's times in life where thinking out of the box is a good thing. When it comes to doctrine, it's not. It's a detrimental thing. To step outside of what God has already laid out for us. Outside of what God has already given to us and instructed us. Well, this morning, based on these two verses, Jude, verses 1 and 2, we see what is earmarked for the Christian. It is exactly what the world longs for but refuses it when it refuses Jesus Christ. You see, this is earmarked only for those who know Christ. Anybody outside of Christ cannot receive these things. So we begin by looking at the Christian identity. What is earmarked for the believer in Christ? For the person who has placed his, her faith in Jesus Christ said, Lord, take my life. I want to be your child. Look at what the scriptures say in regards to Christian identity. It says that the Christian is called, loved, and kept. Now, you're going to see this morning in these verses and then throughout the book of Jude that Jude enjoys using triplets. In other words, he has sets of threes that, uh, that he uses to make the point. And here's the first triplet called, loved, and kept. So let's take a look at that first one. It's verse 1, second half of verse 1. It says, To those who are called, beloved, in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Called. Now, if you were to go back and read this verse in its original Greek language, what you would discover is that the word called is not the first in the triplet, it's the last of the three. And that's because loved and kept define the person who is called by God. In other words, if you are called, you are loved and you are kept. But in the English translation, it made sense for the translators to put it first, called. And so we'll deal with it first as well. What does it mean to be called, Christian? Again, you are earmarked to be called. What does it mean to be called? It means that you are being called out of the world though you still have to live in this world. You're being called out of the world to Christ, even though you still have to live in this world. Out of the world does not mean you don't associate with the world. It does not mean you take on this monastic lifestyle. It does not mean that you become like the Anabaptists of the 1500s that developed a city of their own and they lived cloistered there and tried to associate in no way with any society. They discovered it was impossible. That's not what called means. Called does not mean you isolate yourself from the world. It does not mean that you avoid encounter with the world. What it means to be called out of the world is that first you're being called to Christ, but you're being called away from the immorality of the world. You're not being called away from the world. You're being called away from the immorality that surrounds and carries this world from day to day. Come out of it. And, And the difficulty of that calling is that we live in the world. And it is so easy to be like the world when we live in the world. And as you all know, when you drop a white glove in the mud, the white glove turns muddy. And that's often what happens with the Christian. It is very difficult to live in this world because of the way the world is. And we tend to want to follow the world. Often we don't want to stand out. Often we want to take the easier a path with less resistance, and so we become like the world. God is saying, I'm calling you out of all that, but it is difficult. Now, notice, difficult does not mean impossible. Difficult doesn't even mean improbable. 
It simply means difficult. And so we are called to come out of this world and to Christ. Look, the Christian is called from sin to Christ. From darkness to light. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church? He said, what does a child of God, a child of light, have to do with darkness? And what's the answer? Nothing. We're called from darkness to light. We're called from death to life. We're called from futility and triviality to seriousness, as Matthew Henry puts it. We're called from moral uncleanliness to holiness. You see the contrast? We're called from the pursuit of this world to the pursuit of grace and divine purposes. And yet we live in this world. And notice, called is more than simply being invited. An invitation is, well, you're invited, come if you can. Whoever can come, come. That's not the case here. When God says he calls, he says, there's no rejecting my calling. Called here means that you are chosen of God. You know, years ago when I was a teenage boy, and I guess I had nothing to do, I had a friend that loved airplanes, and so we would go to Newark Airport. And he would just love watching the airplanes, you know. And after one or two, I'm like, well, you know, they all look pretty much the same to me, right? And he was like, oh, look at that one, you know. <laughs> it looked just like the other one to me. But hey, you know, I had nothing else to do. I would go with him, and there we would watch these airplanes. But I decided I thought it would be funny if I would pick up the phone and page people. Of course, you can't do this today. It's probably a felony if you do this today. I don't know. But back then, you could. And so I would pick up the phone and say, excuse me, can you page Mr. Weiser, Mr. Bud Weiser? And you would hear overhead, Mr. Weiser, Bud Weiser, your party will meet you at gate one. I'm like, oh, you know, it's so funny. Miss Chandelier, can you page Miss Chandelier, Crystal Chandelier? And you would hear overhead, Miss Chandelier, Crystal Chandelier, please meet your party at gate two. And we would just chuckle and silly things to do. Just a few months ago, I'm at an airport in Cuba, and I get summoned. I'm like, oh, no. Right or wrong, it's not the thing you want in Cuba is to be summoned anywhere, in all honesty. But it's certainly not at the airport when you're trying to get home. And after a very long week, we were pretty tired. We were excited to go. And I hear my name overhead. I'm like, oh, no. And the fellow I'm with said, what did you do? I said, I have no idea. But boy, I started sweating. I'm like, oh no. And so I start taking all my documents, and boy, did I have documents. Passport, a license, proof that I work for a 501c3, a list of every place I was while there in Cuba. And I'm pulling, and it's this long line, I'm pulling everything out of my pocket. And they summon me, you respond. And I just stood there waiting my turn. And finally, when it was my turn, it was good news. They bumped me up to first class. I was like, oh, great. Unfortunately, it was only a 30-minute flight to Miami. But, <laughs> but I felt like saying, why didn't you just tell me that this was good news? You could have smiled and said, don't worry. None of that. They summoned me. I got up, and I went because they have the authority. I know better than to sit down and ignore them. They called, I responded. And here it is the same thing with God. When he calls, it is an effectual call, as theologians refer to it. Sometimes it's referred to as an irresistible call. It's the call that every one of you who know Christ as your Lord and Savior say, oh yes, I remember that day when I could resist him no longer and I gave my life to Christ. He called, he summoned and I responded. In other words, God's intentions when he calls will be carried out. That person will respond in believing faith. That person will no longer be able to resist God's calling and he, she will be effectually redeemed, effectually saved. 
God calls us. That's the earmark of the Christian. We are called by God. And what a wonderful thing that is. Secondly, it says we are beloved in God or simply loved in God. Uh, and there the word love means, well, what we're familiar with love to mean. It means to take pleasure in, to long for. It, it, it denotes a, a sense of esteem for someone. And here we're told that God has this esteem, this love for us. In fact, the verse says, loved in God. Not loved by God, though that is true. We are loved by God. But the Original language is clear. It's loved in God. The redeemed person, the saved person, is the one who is loved in God the Father. That is to say that this, this verse here identifies the sphere into which you are loved. It's not just who loves you, but the sphere in which, into which you are loved. Not just anyone and everyone being loved, but those who are in God are loved in God. John 14, 23 puts it this way. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. God will make his home with you. You will be at home with God. Now notice here, verse 14, 23, does not say that you must obey in order to be loved, but rather those who are in the sphere of God's love, who are in God, are so because of the love of God. God's love puts you into his sphere, into his arena of love, of fellowship, of friendship. A family. The person who is effectually called by God is affectionately loved by God. This is in the present tense, meaning that every day you are loved in God. Daily. The two always come together, by the way. Called and loved. He does not call who he does not love. He does not uh, 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 love who he, he does not call. There's a saving love here. It, it, yes, God loves his creation in general, but here we're talking about a specific, radical love, a love that gri grabs your soul and grips your conscience and loves you to the point of effectually saving your soul. You are loved in God. Wonderful truth. Romans 9 13 quotes from Malachi chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 and, and it sets a very clear contrast here. Maybe a passage that doesn't sit well with many people but we can't ignore it. It's in the scriptures. It reads this. Jacob I have loved but Esau I have hated. You see Jacob was chosen by God to father a nation. Esau was not. Now, Jacob was not a nice guy, not a likable guy. Most men here would not get along with Jacob. But God said that's despite the fact. I am going to use Jacob for my purposes. Jacob had nothing to offer, and God said, exactly. It's all going to be my own doing. I will call him. I will love him. I will use him. And indeed, God did. Well, before moving on to the next word, notice here, let's go to the end of Jude, verses 20 and 21. Verse 21 has a peculiar phrase that reads, keep yourself in the love of God. You see it? Keep yourself in the love of God. We see here that though God's love is unconditional, we do have a responsibility to keep ourselves in that love. 
What does it mean to keep yourself in the love of God? Well, what that means is that you do not reject the love of God. It means that you don't distance yourself from his love. It means then that you persevere in your faith. Keep yourself in the love of God. And if you read those two verses there, 20 and 21, I'll, I'll just explain it to you. I'll let you read it for yourself at home. You'll notice there yet another triplet. Three ways to keep yourself in God's love. Three ways by which you do not reject God's love. Look at verse 20. It says, build up your faith. Grow in the knowledge of God's doctrines. How else do you keep yourself in the love of God? Verse 20, pray in the Holy Spirit. And then verse 21, wait for or anticipate or long for eternal life. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Long for eternal life. In other words, don't live here on this wor world as if this is the best of life now. My friends, it's going to get far, 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 far better in eternity. Don't live as if this is as good as it's going to be. Long for eternity. Build up your faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. You will be keeping yourself in the love of God. And then there's a third word. Back to chapter 1, verse 1. Called, loved, and then kept. Kept. This simple little phrase or word, being kept by God, is so often questioned. I can't tell you how often I have conversations with people who believe they are saved, but they wonder, did I lose my salvation? So many people wonder whether or not they have distanced themselves so much from God that they would lose the gift of salvation. They wonder whether or not they can escape God's redeeming, saving grip. Well, keep this in mind. Just as we saw that God's calling is perpetual, in fact, we see that it was determined before even time began, God decided that he was going to call you. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 reads this way. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope for, of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised, when? Before the ages began. Just as his calling is perpetual, and just as his loving will never stop, it is ongoing. His love for you, child of God, will never stop. It is ongoing. So you can be sure that his keeping will be ongoing and perpetual. God will not stop keeping your soul. John chapter 10, verse 28 reads this way. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one, did you hear that? No one will snatch them out of my hand. I give them eternal life and no one but no one, absolutely nobody, will snatch them out of my hand. That is the work of our Lord in eternally securing your soul. Why? Why? because he loves you and because he calls you the christian is kept and notice here that it says very specifically i, I appreciate the esv translation best it, it says here that the christian is kept for christ did you notice that it does not say as some translations it is kept by or in christ uh, i think the best translation would have to be for christ the christian is kept for Christ, which means that your salvation now is not directed toward, your, toward yourself, but rather it's directed towards God. You are being saved for the glory of God. To be kept for Christ means that the purpose of Christ's atoning work on the cross will be fulfilled. He will fulfill his purpose. 
His death was not for naught. He did not die and just cross his fingers and hope this really works. No, he will save who he calls in due time. And, and Christian, you are living proof of that. I stand here as living proof that God will have his way and he will save who he calls to himself. We do not have to fear that. He is able. He is creating for himself an assembly of saints. Christians. The church. An assembly of saints that will bring glory to Christ. He is building, as we read in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, he is building a people for himself. A people who will extol his glories. That's why he called you. That's why he loves you. And that's why he keeps you. He is glorified in this process, but we are the beneficiaries, for sure. We benefit from this calling and this love and this keeping. Well, that's the Christian's identity. There's one more verse to look at there this morning. Verse 2. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Again, we see a triplet, don't we? These three things are what humans instinctively long for. Mercy, peace, and love. Uh, think about it. Why do you avoid people who don't like you? Why do you avoid people you don't like? Why do you avoid your enemy? Because they do not give you peace, mercy, or love. That's what we long for. They don't offer it. Here are some questions for you to think about. What do we expect from those who are closest and dearest to us? We expect them to give us mercy, peace, and love. When do marriages go sour? When there is no mercy, peace, or love. What do we offer to those who, who care most about us? Well, we're more than willing to give them mercy, peace, and love. Why? Because they're dear to us. When do we best emulate Jesus Christ? Well, we best emulate Christ when we are merciful, peaceful, and loving people. What can we never give too much of? Mercy, peace, and love. What can we never receive too much of? Mercy, peace, and love. Nobody ever says, oh, no, 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 please, no more mercy. Oh, no, please, no more peace. I'm up to here in peace. We all want more mercy, peace, and love. And you'll notice here, my friends, that there is a tumble effect. Mercy leads to peace. Peace leads to love. Love leads to mercy. It just keeps going. Christ's love to us leads for us to love Christ, enabling us then to love others. You'll remember what John tells us in his first epistle. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And because he first loved us, we can love others. And we can extend peace and mercy to others. Whereas being called, loved, and kept defines the Christian, uh, who the Christian is. It's a defining triplet. What we see here is an encouraging triplet, if you will. The Christian receives, as an earmark, mercy, peace, and love. As children of God, as Christians, we already possess mercy, peace, and love. But notice here what Jude writes. He is praying for them, and he prays that this mercy, peace, and love may be multiplied to you. Multiplied. Not just added, 
but rather a substantial increase. My friends, Christian, you do not need to be satisfied with scant amounts of, per, of mercy, peace, and love. God is more than willing to bless you with multiplied amounts of mercy, peace, and love. And many of us live with just a little bit, just enough to fill our pockets just halfway. Just enough there reserved for when there's a problem. But God says, no. I have mercy, peace, and love in abundance, and it can be yours. And Jude here is praying for these people that they would have a multiplied amount of mercy, peace, and love. That's my prayer for you as well. It's my prayer for myself. Multiplied amounts of mercy, peace, and love. So why is there this void that they don't have all that multiplied amount of mercy, peace, and love? What could be the reason? Well, could it be? Could it be that their willingness to open doors to false teachers is impeding their Christian life? Could it be that their willingness to embrace things that are not true is actually hampering God's blessing of mercy, peace, and love? So much so that here Jude is praying that God would multiply this mercy, peace, and love to them. Uh, Jude here prays that their lives would be enriched with mercy, peace, and love. And now he's going to show them how his prayers are to be fulfilled. Christ did say that it is truth that will set you free, correct? The truth shall set you free. Christ did not say that a variation of the truth will set you free. No, the truth will set you free. Well, here, Jude is going to give them that truth that's going to set them free. And what will be the result? The result will be a multiplication of mercy, peace, and love in their lives. You see, truth really does matter. These are God's blessings. And God's blessings are always God's blessings. But God's blessings don't just readily fall out of the sky onto us. God blesses us in particular ways. He blesses us through specific methods. Now, let me try to illustrate it this way. If I am hot and there's a breeze outside, I can't stand in front of a closed window and expect to receive the breeze. No, I need to open the window and I need to stand in front of the window and then I'll benefit from the breeze. And my friends, likewise, with the truth of God, if you want to know his blessings, you have to go to the place and the way in which he pours out his blessings. Open the window. In this case, by opening the window, what you're doing is looking to see what God's truth is, learning it, and then applying it. Not a variation of the truth, but you want to know the truth so you can know his blessing, his mercy, his peace, his love in abundant amounts. And so that's what Jude does for them. He explains to them, it comes down to this. If I were to say it in the negative, an improper understanding of Christ will steal God's blessings from you. Let me put it in a positive. You will know God's blessings of mercy, peace, and love to the degree that you seek to comprehend his truth accurately. No truth, no blessing. No truth, K-N-O-W, and you will know his blessings. Keep this in mind. As you read through the scriptures, you're going to find things there that just doesn't sit well in your stomach. You're like, really? Really? God's truth is not always practical. There are things in, in, in this book here that are hard, not only to comprehend, but to, but to digest. Some of it just lodges right here in the, in the throat of my soul. But it is what God said. And he means what, what he says. Uh, some of his truths are not very expedient. His truths are not always Embraced by the masses, his truth doesn't always make sense to us. But look, God's truth, as it has been revealed to us 
here in this book, God's truth is always right. It is always effective. God's truth is always divinely wise. It is always best. And it's always just. In short, God's truth will work when nothing else does. And God's truth will actually bring you blessing in your life. As you know it and as you practice it, you will discover mercy, peace, and love. Why? Because you are called, you are loved, you are kept. Biblical conviction is essential. When I first came to Christ, it was okay for me to say, all I know is that I was blind, but now I see. But those days are far gone. And if you are new in Christ, that's a great place to start. But you need to move beyond that. Go from the milk to meat and understand the truths of God. Otherwise, this is what's going to happen. As you spend time not learning God's word, confusion is going to leave you in a very unsettled and empty place. You will be confused. You will be frightened by God's word. You will find yourself very empty as well. Before you know it, you're going to be thinking back the way you used to. You're going to think like the world. And the next thing you know, there's going to be a spiritual chaos in you unraveling your faith, and there's going to be a settling of doubt in your conscience, in your heart, and you're going to begin to wonder, is this true after all? And you will be then susceptible to the lies of the devil as those doubts grow and increase and abound. The Christian's advantage is that you have been lavished through God lavished amounts of mercy, peace, and love through his word. You need to understand his word, access his word, so that you can access his blessings, know his truth. These are the very things you long for. Keep that in mind. Mercy, peace, and love. The very thing the world lacks and cannot offer to you. Mercy, peace, and love. And it's offered to you through the proper understanding of God's word and then, of course, the proper application of God's word. Now, in closing, let me just say this. There is here a past, present, and future component to what we see in these two verses. In the past, you were called. In the present, you are loved. And for the future, you are kept. And for that sake, because of that uh, uh, that truth, that reality, we can praise God, we can rejoice and be content, and we can then move on and say, Lord, if you're willing to do this for me, I don't always understand everything you've written, but this, th this I know, I will commit myself to believing it and practicing it and learn to understand it as time goes on. I do not suggest that you just in blind faith, obey God. Perpetually. No. But if need be, that's where you start. Say, Lord, I don't understand, but I do trust that what you said is true. And I will stand there, and then I will move on and grow in my understanding and practice of your word. And, and listen, I assure you, mercy, peace, and love will be yours in abundant amounts. In the worst of times, you'll be able to say, wow, there's a lot of peace. In the most heated hours, you're going to say, wow, there's a lot of mercy. And how is it that I can be so loving and loved in these dire days? Well, it will be because of God's truth working in your life. And you will not in any way regret that. This is what human souls long for. And my friends, it's been earmarked for you. Make sure you make good use of it. God owns you. And what a wonderful place that is to be. Let me pray. Our Lord and Savior, thank you. Because you are our God. You are a good God and a wise God. 
And Lord, because of your goodness and because of your wisdom, we can trust in you. Help us, though, as well to understand your word and trust you even more. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship our Lord. Let's sing to our God. The words will be there on the screen for you. It is good to be able to lift up our voices in response to his word. Oh, there you are. You're already standing. <laughs> when darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to Steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know oh, I, I won't, won't be shaken, shaken. Oh, I, I won't, won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance oh my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand in your love. I'm standing, stand. Stand in your Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you as always. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for uh, the reminder of your promises to us, uh, the work that you are doing in us. We thank you, Lord God, that you have called us out of the world, out of the darkness, Lord God, into your glorious light, into Christ. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Thank you, Lord God, that we are loved by you and kept by you. And that even, Lord God, that when we fail, Lord God, you are there loving us and keeping us. That your promises are true and they are eternal. 
and that we have nothing to fear when we stand in you and we stand on the promises of Christ and on Christ himself. We thank you, Lord God, for the mercy that you give us, the peace and love that you bestow on us, which gives us, Lord God, the ability to share that with others, to share that mercy with others that you have given us, that peace that you have given us we can share with others, and that love that we can share with one another and to the world. We ask, Lord God, as it's been mentioned, that this is, these are dark times. This, this is a dark world, and uh, there are many fears and troubles. But, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you would be working in the hearts of those that have the power and ability to make huge choices for everyone. The fear of pushing buttons and, and uh, using their authority in, in evil ways, Lord God. We pray that you would uh, press upon them, Lord God, uh, the truth of, Lord God, your promises, the truth of who you are, that you would reveal yourself to them, Lord God, and change their hearts. The only way, Lord God, to change our world is to change hearts. And Lord God, may we be a part of that. Lord God, may you use us and work through us, Lord God, that we would be that city on a hill, that we would not, Lord God, be greedy with the salvation that you have given us, but we would share it, Lord God. That we'd share your glory, and we would share, Lord God, who you are with others. That we make it you known to the world, Lord God, that your name would be great among all the nations, and that we would live as peaceably as we can on this side of heaven. We ask, Lord God, for this peace and this mercy, Lord God, to uh, overflow in the lives of the Frères and the, and the Bay Hags um, in their concerns this week, Lord God, as they deal with family um, illnesses. And we ask, Lord God, for comfort and, and peace and wisdom uh, for all of them, Lord God, and for healing, Lord God, for, uh, for Debbie's family, for Jen, and for Ken as well. We trust you, Lord God, and that you will, it is good, and that you heal because you can heal, and we pray that you would. These things we pray, Lord God, in your son's precious name. All glory be yours, Lord God, all honor be yours, and all praise is yours, Lord God, today and forevermore. Amen. God's mercies are new, morning by morning. Daily, daily I surrender Grace for today is all that I need Surprised by your mercy that's new every morning Awaken my soul to Morning by morning, great is your faith. 
for your faithfulness. We pray that we would be faithful to you this week and bring you glories. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.